everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the ToneMob.com podcast, the show about guitar tone and people behind it. As per usual, I'm your host, Blake Wylan, and with me today, I have Josh Scott of JHS Pedals. What's going on, man? Uh, Not much. Um, Glad to be on here, man. Thanks for the opportunity to hang out and chat and uh, look forward to it. Yeah, it'll be a good time. I'm glad to uh, finally be able to uh, well, if I could talk, uh, finally be able to sit down and talk with you. I've been uh, excited about this one for a long time. So, all right, man. Yeah, we've uh, we've went back and forth. Tried to do this for like three months, I think. So, yeah, it's good to get it going. That sounds about right. Yeah. So, uh, what have you been up to today? I know the day is still fairly young, but you're a early riser. So, yeah, we uh, we actually the company is closed on Fridays. We're a four ten company, so we do. Monday through Thursday, six to five, but I am at the shop by myself. It's nice and quiet, and uh, just doing some odds and ends, hanging out. Um, kind of an off day. Nice. Those are got those are got to be off. nice days. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. It's an off day, and I'm at work, but it's <laughs> yeah. That should tell you right there. That yeah. that does tell me. You've been uh, yeah. all over the place. It's I. Like, you've just been following you on Instagram and stuff. It's like, oh, you're here. Now you're over here. Now you're over there. Wow. Like, yeah. Uh, this, uh, usually the fall season is, is pretty bonkers. And then this year it feels twice as as busy. So, yeah, it's, uh, it looks really glamorous sometimes, I think, if you follow Instagram. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty tiring. And, you know, go into fly here, fly there, do a demo, fly out you know, late flights, crammed flights. And uh, I caught myself on a flight the other day and I just, you start to feel like a, like a cow in a cattle trailer, like walking onto the plane. (laughs) So yeah, it's, it's a, for all of you who want a job traveling, um, it's pretty cool for like a few times. And then, uh, and then you're like, Hmm, I really want to go home. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit of that going on, but super thankful. Um, you know, obviously all our fans and people that, that buy our stuff, thankful for, uh, just, uh, how you've made the business grow. And, and with that comes some traveling for me. So it's all good, man. For sure. So I got the, uh, speaking of your, what you got going on right now. Um, well actually it's not going on right now, but it was recently, I got to try the muffaletta the other day and that thing was, uh, all right. was very sick and, uh, exactly as advertised. So well done. Thanks, man. That was a just a fun thing to finally put out. You know, it's a couple of years of of working on it on and off, and uh, just man, we've been blown away by the response. Uh, just honestly, kind of shocked. It's our most successful release to date, um, and didn't know how it'd be perceived because it's it's kind of a crazy thing, you know. And no one had done that. Didn't know how it'd be received, but man, we are super thankful for everybody that's picked one up and just kind of blown us away. Well, it's a great concept. I mean, uh, everyone's got the, kind of their their favorite muff variety, and uh, like, why choose when you can have you know almost all of them? Like, <laughs> yeah, that that was the that was the goal. That's a great great idea. So, yeah. Anyway, I'll dive right into my my normal questions that I like to get into. Um, yeah, yeah. S- starting with uh, your musical backstory, uh, you know. Pre JHS, yeah. back when you was a wee lad, first strumming on a whatever you were strumming on. Yeah. Uh, so just go for it. Kind of how. So just how it all started for me. Is that what you're interested in? Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. So, um, man, I grew up in a in a in a family where my mom and dad they jokingly say they they can't turn on a radio properly, like they're that <laughs> musical. <laughs> Um, I have, I have a brother, it's 10 years older. He, he played piano, fantastic piano player by ear and all, but I was, I wasn't around him much, 10, 10 year gap. So right. yeah, he moved out when I was eight. So that's kind of a funny thing. But later in life, um, I ended up at my brother's, uh, at my brother's apartment. I was, you know, kind of getting into the teenage years and, uh, this was like cassette tape days and he had, my brother had the craziest color. I can still see it. just like shelves of cassette tapes. It's a really funny memory. But, um, I remember 
music never really caught my attention or got you know i just it was like music was always there and like this was like during the um during the 90s when like country music was king like garth brooks ruled the world and all this and it just oh yeah so so like i grew up in alabama and like obviously like country you know just, country music was everywhere like garth brooks was playing madison square garden in central park you know it was like what is going on? <laughs> right. And you had you you had this crazy amount of country music. Is all that's my one memory, and how I never really, you know, like some of the songs that stuck in your head, and, my, and you just listen to it because everyone does. But I never liked it really. I never was like, yeah, this is it, man. And then one day, I was at my brother's house, and uh, I was flipping through cassettes, which I would do, and he had the usual stuff that I'd heard my entire life, like. The Cure. He was like big into some of the '80s alternative stuff, and and I never like like that either. But then I I saw Pearl Jam Ten. I remember the cover, and I was like, oh, pop this in. It's kind of a weird cover. They're like holding their hands up, and and the cassette was on Alive. And um, when I popped it in, and it was like the guitar solo, and that was uh, I went. Ooh, you know, that was like the first thing that, that, that I gravitated towards. And um, by that time, Pearl Jam, I think, was on their third record. But so I was kind of late to the game. And man, I really got into the whole Seattle scene. It, it was all so interesting. Um, I remember someone, I ended up grabbing like Nirvana Unplugged and then Nevermind. And then, then came Soundgarden. And then came, ooh, like, what are these bands? And it was just like, that whole scene, even into stuff like Rage Against the Machine and yes. all of that. And then I started to appreciate some of my brother's music. Like I was like, The Cure, they don't really suck. They're kind of cool. And then it was like, Tears for Fears. Wow, that's interesting. Or And even stuff like Bruce Hornsby, all this stuff. He had this massive collection. I would just go over there and listen. And that's when MTV actually played videos. And uh, I can remember just kind of getting in, into guitar through that channel. and. Um, for me, it was just, you know, less. Gra- the internet was so new. I remember I had dial up Prodigy Internet. And, I would get <laughs> yeah. on, and the Guitar Tab websites had started. And I would just get on there and just like print stacks. I mean, I would go to my um, computer science lab class and just print books of tabs and go home and play for 10, 15 hours. So that's how it all started. Mm-hmm. It was definitely rock, you know, the the guitar coming back into the scene and the grunge thing. And and so I uh, ended up, uh, you know, I was, went to a very small school and not even a city, kind of just a little town. And there was a couple of us goofing around. We started a band and that was cool. And I remember we were going to play this talent show and um, the sing I was playing guitar and then like the singer like got scared and didn't even come so I ended up singing and and I and I've you know that's I'm a songwriter and stuff as well on the side a little bit I don't do that much anymore but you know before the whole pedal thing I was doing a good amount of music and and all so it just kind of evolved from that I was in another band and then we got fairly successful so I just have a background with playing around you know and then um I got into the pedal thing because I had a broken pedal as a player and I fixed it to my surprise. And um, kind of the rest is history. You know, it's like the hobby, hobby took over. Yeah. So, yeah, just a player, you know, just your typical, two, you know, class of 2000 grunge kid um, that uh, got into guitar and accidentally fixed a pedal. <laughs> what was that first pedal that you fixed? Yeah, the, this is funny. It's it's such a killer story because um, I the first like boutiquey thing I ever had. Well, I had a full drive. Everyone had a full drive, but of course, I remember getting Robert Keeley's modded blues driver, and I ended up with two of them on my board, and one of them was that, and I fixed it. And now with Robert, you know, we did the steak and eggs, and he's been. <clears throat> He's been a phenomenal guy in my life with the growth of the company and stuff, just to have a legend. It's kind of like being able to call up Larry Bird and ask him how to, you know, shoot three pointers. It's like, <laughs> right. it's, it's really phenomenal. So I've got the, you know, we, we've talked about that and just how funny that is. And, uh, he's so gracious and all, but yeah, it was a Keeley blues driver and, and now we've done a collaborative pedal. So that's pretty cool. I mean, that for me, that's, that's like, 
another you know it's just amazing to look back and go wow that is bizarre that is really awesome that is that, yeah. like how did you two end up hooking up like that's interesting uh yeah so nam 2014 robert like i had never uh, i almost didn't know what he looked like um i wasn't you'd see a few pictures here and there and robert like I started this whole thing around oh oh eight, and I got you know it got more serious, and then the company starts growing, and and you kind of you know I've always been very out front, like I'm fine acting like an idiot, doing funny stuff, like I am you know I'm the face of the company, and that's cool, and I and like Robert, I would never see him, like certain companies they just you know some people are different like i'm very out front and then a lot of guys don't ever come out front they're not that personality or whatever and i had never seen robert really and then all of a sudden i was at nam uh, anaheim 2014 and he had a booth and i was like wow robert keely has a booth like i hadn't seen him with a booth in a long time to my knowledge and he never came to any of the amp shows so I didn't know if he like liked me, hated me, loved me. I didn't know anything about Robert. <laughs> and so I just, I'm just me. I walk over and I go, Robert Keeley, I just want to shake your hand. Man, thanks for what you do. And I just said, man, I've been a fan for so long. I've used your pedals. Um, I got into this because one of my pedals broke. It was yours. And then I got curious about mods. And like, I just want to thank you, man, for, you know, just, just thanks, you know, I was just being humble and just like really thankful that what he had done in this industry. And man, he just immediately lit up and was like the most kind guy right off the bat and grabbed me. We went and sat down and talked for like an hour and a half. He came and visited like a couple weeks later, saw the, saw the uh, process we go through. And like, from that point on, we were kind of like, he was watching how I've built like as a company and he'd be like, man, that's such a great idea. And I would watch him and go, man, that's a great idea. And we, kind of fed off each other for like a year or more. And that led to the steak and eggs thing. Um, I went down to, to uh, Oklahoma and it's just been like a, it's been a really cool relationship, like a true kind of industry, industry friendship kind of tell each other, you know, kind of secrets of the trade of what we've learned over the years. He's obviously learned a lot more, but um, it's been cool to just be involved at all. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's just a bizarre story. It's funny. Yeah. It's crazy. That's, that's yeah. so, that's so cool when that kind of thing happens. It's uh it's amazing. It's one of the things I really like about being so involved in this industry is everybody I've ran into is super cool. And I know that sounds cliche because everyone says it over and over again, but that's the truth. Like everybody I've talked to, I'm like, man, that guy's a cool guy. I want to go have a beer with him. Like, <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, there are some of the greatest people, man, in the in the pedal industry, and I just, yeah, it, it's just a good time to be in it. Um, it's it's just an amazing era. I think we'll look back and see so much cool stuff come from this era. A lot of creative people and kind people, really gracious people as well. Yeah, I kind of think like the pedal the pedal section of everything kind of started leading the charge here. What I don't know. 10, 15 years ago as far as the, yeah. you know, boutique stuff. And then, like, I think the the amp and the guitars are, are starting to follow suit. Uh, it seems like the, yeah. that that market is, is going nuts as well, and I love it. Because now, as a player, there's even more choices. And it's, it's, it's so incredible to be a gearhead right now. Like, we're so spoiled. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. It's like overload. I mean, I... Uh, now being, you know, almost 10 years in, I think like guys like Robert, just to hear their stories, like, I don't know Mike Fuller, but to know what I know of his story, how he started Sean at Love Pedal is a good friend. These, these guys that really did trailblaze like Bob Weil, visual sound. It's so cool to see what they started and then see where it's at now. And like you said, a lot of these amp guys and, and, um, guitar guys, it's just like the whole industry is on fire. It's really cool. It is. And it's cool that, that players are recognizing and, and, and going out to these other, you know, new companies and checking out their stuff. It's just, yeah, it's a good time to be a gearhead. That's all there is. to It, it. is. It's a, da- it's a dangerous time. Yeah. <laughs> it is dangerous. My wallet thinks it's not a good time to be a gearhead, but yeah, <laughs> 
So yeah, that's that's cool. Let's see. Since we're talking, we've ventured into the gear. I should see. Uh, I know. I know you've got lots at your disposal. But what is your current rig if you was to go like play a gig tomorrow? Yeah, and I do here and there uh, when I'm in town. <laughs> so my current my current rig will be. I have a lot of gear. I think you've probably seen <laughs> pictures. Um, but I, my current rig, my go-to stuff is some type of 112 amp. Like I've got a, a Morgan PR12. I have a Milkman Creamer. Those are both Princeton-esque things. Um, if I'm doing something that needs to be a little louder, probably my go-to, my most used over the years go-to rig is like a Sobtech MIG 50 head, which is a oh yeah six like a 6L6 basement thing. I have a lot of basements, so some some type of basement, probably the Sobtech and a, and a 212 cab like Greenbacks. And then as far as pedals, um, that changes, but I mean, there's always some of the same things like... Like a, I always have a morning. A morning glory has always been on there since the day I created it. Um, Understandably, yeah, just just different things. I'm a big fan of a lot of other companies. Like I usually have an H9, like the Eventide stuff. Uh, the Diamond Vibrato is basically always on the board. A Klon is always on my board. And then as far as guitars, uh, I an Elliott Tone Master. I have a serial number in the 30s. If you're familiar with that, it's the Peter Stroud model. I uh, that is my number one of all. And then uh, if I'm if I'm doing a gig, I'll probably take that and one of my Fanos. Oh like yeah, the, the GF, G, yeah. yeah, the GF6 mm-hmm. or like the the TC6. But I have a Cower that's really great. I, a lot of guitars, but. I typically play the same two unless we're jamming at the shop or goofing off on break. I mean, if I'm playing a show, it's like probably the same two guitars. Right. Yeah. I've heard that I've never, I've never got to play one, but I've heard the Elliot stuff is ridiculously awesome. It is, man. It's a, it's, it's like the guitar that when I got it and played it, it's like, I actually was like, this is my guitar. It, It like felt that way, you know? Um, you always hear those stories, but for me, that guitar is definitely that. And I'll go through trends where I'll play something else, but it's like I always go to that guitar, always get it exactly the sound I hear in my head with the pedals I use in the amps. And yeah, I could die happy if that was my only guitar. Well, that's a that's a big statement. So that almost uh, that almost negates my my next question that I like to ask. Um, because it sounds like you've already got it, but I, I generally ask people what their dream rig is, but it seems, yeah. seems like you've pretty much covered that already. Um, you know, that's a, I've never thought about that. And, um, I think, yeah, I think that is, I think I have my dream rig. I'm, I'm really satisfied. I'm, I'm in a position obviously where I get to play pretty much everything and have been, you know, that's really nice. And I'm thankful for that and don't take it for granted, but you know, I've tried all kinds of amps and friends that make some of the best gear on earth. And yeah, I think I like my rig. I've tried a lot of stuff and I love a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, but I think, yeah, you're probably right. I've never thought about it, but that's probably, that's probably right. Yeah. Yeah. So we just covered a whole bunch of ground there. I was going to go current rig, dream rig. Oh, favorite guitar. Well, well, we got that out of the way too. Yeah. (laughs) Well, that that's probably right. I mean, I also I'm a big acoustic guy, so okay. I have a, you know, I'm a, so I still write and stuff, and I I I love just writing on acoustics and and doing stuff like that. I I have a little bit of a bulky bluegrass side, like a big Dylan fan and and all that Neil Young. So I I you know I have an old I got a seventy two D twenty eight that I really love and. I've got a Bob Taylor built 710 with a cedar top that's like stinking amazing. So I've got I got some acoustic stuff that I equally would grab if the house was on fire. So right on. So is, is that what you normally play? Would be like kind of more the acoustic bluegrassy, maybe not bluegrassy, but singer songwriter type of thing. Well, if I'm playing guitar, I always end up playing in like rock bands and gigs which i you know that's if if someone's like hey come out to the club play this show with me or like there's 
couple local artists I've played with, you know, over the last few years, that's kind of what happens. Or I have a friend that has a studio, like come over and track some guitars. I am typically like, you know, JHS, the rock guy, like I can, I can handle the kind of whatever in that genre. So I typically play more electric and, and all. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. That's, that's usually what I end up doing too. And it, it's kind of where I gravitate. I I, lo- I like acoustic guitars, and I learned on acoustic guitars, but I always am more interested in electrics for whatever reason. But uh, yeah, totally. I I'm probably equally interested. They're just I always get asked to do the other. You know, usually. Yeah. <clears throat> I hear that. So, do you have any? Um, yeah, you you can. You can choose not to answer this question if if you would prefer. But do you have any um, okay. little teasers uh, uh, or things in the pipeline that uh, we should start revving our engines for? Yeah, yeah. I, I have a few things. I mean, if anyone's followed JHS over the last few years, we you know we're uh, there is a strategy to releases. We like to shock and awe you, and then put a you know a teasers out and drive you crazy and mm-hmm. and. Uh, that's loved and hated, but mostly loved. And But there are a few things that I can bring up. Um, we have had the honor of uh, Mr. Andy Timmons, if anyone, you know, he has a lot of fans. You either kind of love him or don't know who he is. Um, but he's an amazing uh, guitar player, you know. Uh, just just check him out. He did a, my favorite work is he covered the entire Sgt. Pepper's record, record instrumentally with a three-piece band live. Wow. Uh, wow. It's like, you got to <laughs> check it out. Go to iTunes. So Andy Timmons is his name, but we're putting out his signature JHS pedal. Um, it'll, you'll see it probably. I mean, it's coming up at, right by Thanksgiving. Probably it might be a black Friday release. Um, so that's new and that's, it's a killer version of our, one of our most popular pedals, the angry Charlie. It's his own tweaked version with the, It's a Marshall kind of 800 sound, yeah. but uh, his version has like a 50 watt, 25 watt switch and then different tapers on the EQ. It's really fantastic. Um, so that's coming up and uh, we just shot some videos for that in Dallas. And uh, we showed at the LA show. I have been busy now that I'm naming this stuff. I think we, <laughs> we'll, like you'll text me and I'll be in some other city. But yeah, we were in LA at the <clears throat> uh, Van Nuys um, LA Amp Show. Yeah, and uh, we debuted on that board, still pretty secretly. Um, but I can say it here. You know, people have seen it. It's going to be um, a pedal that was the original idea of the color box. So the color box, um, a lot of you guys might know what that is. It's our most expensive pedal. It's, uh, it's, it's made to emulate uh, plugging directly into the desk of like a British console, like Beatles White Album or modern bands like Spoon and Wilco have done, kind of made popular that, that revolution sound like on a Beatles record. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dave Grohl yeah. kind of did a documentary on yep. a, a similar uh, board, I, uh, if I recall. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that pedal started as a real simple idea with three knobs, but it turned into the color box, which is, you know, seven knobs, a switch, a Londol custom transformer, you know, 400 plus bucks. So we're putting out a, uh, the version that was the original idea called the crayon. And uh, that'll be probably a Thanksgiving time frame as well. Uh, yeah, that's kind of the two things I can go into. And then we've got some goodies for Nam, a lot of goodies for Nam. Mm. So yeah, so January will be busy, busy, but uh, a lot of that's coming together. And super excited. Like this has been a uh, like a milestone year for us. Like just getting stuff done and just some of the creative ideas that have come out have just been so awesome. And um, yeah, I'm excited for January to show some of that off. That'll be very cool. So does, does the crayon, I just had this, this question cause I did see some pictures of it. Um, 
Does it have the uh, DI out portion like the color box has? It does not. It is straight up uh, a drive pedal. Gotcha. It is made for. It's made for the guy that he wants to plug in and he wants dirt and he wants to use a guitar amp. It's real simple. Mm-hmm. You know, it's going to be the price point of a normal pedal. Um, so you know, one ninety nine. So it's uh, it's going to fill that void of people who don't want to turn that much into a color box or they don't need the DI features. They don't want to run microphones or use it for drums or bass or whatever. Gotcha. Yeah, the color box has actually been on my list for a while because of the DI feature. Yeah. Uh, but I see I can definitely see the crayon doing well. That's a that's a great idea to strip it down that yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because it you know, it is stripped down, but that was the original idea and uh it kind of feature creep happened, you know, like oh, oh add yeah, this add this feature, add this feature, and then it was like Oh my gosh, how are we going to fit it in a case? And then, <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of features. It is. It's cool. So have you got to, um, I know you did the demos and stuff, but have you got to, so you, the, I'm fumbling again. Have you got to use that pedal much in, like you say, you've been going into studios with guys? That seems like, like a super awesome studio tool to me. The color box? Yeah. Yeah. Man, that, that whole pedal, um, just another one of those stories where it's just like kind of a dream come true scenario. We, um, we finished that thing and, um, worked about a, worked about a year on it really hard. I mean, the muffaletta was two years, but kind of an unfocused two years of work while other things were being focused on. But the color box was like a year of really hard work to get that off the ground. I mean, it's just such a, high level of engineering and you know being self-taught and stuff is just like learning like basically it was a college course along the way and then getting that out and being really inspired by uh, a lot of uh, the Beatles type stuff and then some of my favorite bands like one of them is Spoon and if you listen to like Gimme Fiction um, records where they're plugging directly into pre's and things that w- I would literally take those records, like especially Spoon and some of the Wilco, Jeff Tweedy, Nile stuff. I would listen to that, and we try to really get this box to do that thing, uh, so people could have it on their board because there was no device on earth that did that sound for a pedal board, and you know it's just difficult. And then um, we actually. You know, we finished the pedal, and then Abbey Road lets us come in. We flew over to London and shot the initial videos in Studio 2. That was surreal. So we spent an entire day in Studio 2, which is where every Beatles record, I mean, the exception of just a few things, was recorded. So, I mean, we're in the room. You know, you can go watch those demos. That was, like, surreal. We're we're Googling pictures and, like, trying to find where they were standing. And you've got, like... Dark Side of the Moon tracked in there, you know. Wow. OK Computer. Just some of the greatest records that I, as a player and guitar player and music lover, just like, it was just surreal. So we do that, and then we come back, and then lo and behold, like, we get in touch with Spoon, and they're so awesome. They're just so nice. And I flew down to Austin to Public Hi-Fi, which is the, the drummer's studio, Jim Eno, and I get to set in while the new record, They Want My Souls being uh, tracked and mixed, I get to set there as he's using a color box. Um, like the literal band that I set there and would be like, I want the guitar to sound like this. He's holding the color box. And then it ends up on all, pretty much every pedal board. It was on three of the boards on their tour, that entire tour. Um, and they were using the color box to play the songs live that I had put on that I were I was playing to try to get the does that make sense like I would be yeah. listening I'd be listening to Gimme Fiction like Beast and Dragon Adored and I'd listen to that guitar solo and I'd be like does the color box nail this yes and then they end up using it live to do that song and that was um that was pretty amazing um that's incredible It doesn't get, I mean, that was like the pinnacle of like, wow, this is, this is like super amazing. And then, um, I was in Chicago and, uh, got to swing by the loft, 
and I met Jeff Tweedy walked in and same scenario. Uh, he was, you, you know, got a hold of it and loves it. And some of that, it's just, just crazy. Just really grateful for that experience. And like two of my biggest musical hero kind of things, um, actually owning the pedal and using it in real life. It doesn't, you don't get much more of a, uh, a ringing endorsement than than that <laughs> no i mean yeah like the spoon thing was just so wild like seeing it like i know jeff um you know he was using it on recording and then live some and nails Clyde has one it's hard to i never saw pictures of the live rigs but with spoon like hung out at a couple sound checks and shows and the, the pedal is literally on the board and that is what they're using for the parts that was it doesn't get better than that i mean that was amazing that's incredible that really is i can't imagine what that would be like that's that's just i'm i'm kind of like blown away just hearing about it yeah it was very (laughs) very cool man very cool can you talk about abbey road a little bit more because i like that's kind of a bucket list item for me i did get to go over to london but of course i didn't get to go in there um yeah i would i just want to see it it's it sounds amazing (laughs) Yeah, it um so as a player um before the pedal thing I all I also was always into recording and I did a lot of engineer work. I produced a few things. Like I've always loved the studio stuff. So getting to go there was just surreal. Um I mean in a nutshell, you know, everyone's seen the front view with the wall and people drawing the wall. So, you know, just getting to walk in the front door was amazing. And then, you know, we walk in and we have a whole day there. And we basically, uh, we found like a, a tech rental service. We rented a a few amps and guitars, had them delivered there and basically treated it like they gave us the whole studio too, which is, you know, the stairwell room, which is mm-hmm. the original, the Beatles room. Uh, they gave it to us for uh, 10 or 12 hours. I can't remember. So we were there all day, had our own engineer. And, um, yeah, it was just crazy. I mean, you walk in and, like, you open these big doors. You push them open into Studio 2, and they close. And you just, like, you're hearing the room that all these, I mean, so many songs. Um, gosh, it's, like, overwhelming. Like, seriously, there's not many you know, without being cheesy, it was just like, there's not many musical things that can move you like that. You know, I remember walking into the room and just thinking like, gosh, what songs have come out of here? I mean, just, just lists. I mean, if you're a Beatles fan, like everyone probably is, and you know their work, like you could hear that room. When you walk in the room, you start realizing, oh, I've heard this room. You really can hear that room. Um, And then, just having this, you know, somewhat of private tour through some of the things. Like we got to prowl through the mic locker. Wow. Saw like Ringo's drum mics and one of Lennon's mics and stuff that they were sure that they had used. And, you know, my engineer guy that was there, he's probably in his mid twenties. And it was funny. He was kind of disinterested. It was just old news to him, but I'd be walking through like, man, you have to tell me, like, tell me anything. Like, tell me, like where did where what's been used on what you know I'm just like geeking out <laughs> and, he, and he's kind of like yeah like these speak they had these speakers hanging up for like talkback speakers like basically just glorified right. PA he's like yeah that's that's what Dark Side of the Moon was mixed on they're not that good so we put them out here and I'm just like oh my god the, <laughs> the speakers dark and then he's you know he points over he's like yeah and another pink that's the that's the Hammond organ you hear all over Dark Side of the Moon. It's just like setting in the corner and then he takes us into the reverb chamber, the tile room. So it is like any echo you hear on those Beatles records, they were shooting it into that room and recapturing it. Got to go stand in there. It's just like, just so cool to go up the stairwell to look down and, you know, there's so many pictures of, you know, Lennon and McCartney setting in front of those windows, looking down into the studio, just amazing the baffles the original baffles um uh even stories like they were really kind to spend some time with us telling us some of the stories of the original wood floor was ripped up but one of the engineers was very against it so 
uh, the story goes he came in and he actually numbered the wood panels and they stacked them in the closet because he knew the, the room would not sound the same and he kept arguing it, but they didn't believe him. So the new wood floor goes in and it sounds horrible and he had numbered every wood piece and they reinstalled it perfectly. Like just stuff like, <laughs> oh, wow. like, like people that people that kind of preserved that room. I mean, it's just amazing. And then, yeah, I've said it, but just so many records, Radiohead, like the Oasis records, the just the Floyd stuff. There's just so many records out of particularly that room. Studio One is is down the hall, and that is that's your Star Wars soundtrack, Lord of the Rings. That's where the big symphonies do stuff. That was that was surreal too. That room is huge. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's just it is surreal. It's it's like it's like a Mecca or something, you know, to get to see and, and hear the stories of just so, so much happened in that building. I'm still like, I'm still kind of yeah. laughing inside about that, that engineer guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They him. don't, they don't sound that good. You know, Oh, it's like, Oh, it's just one of the most iconic records of all time was mixed on them, but they're not that good. Yeah. Like, <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Yeah. Then. Yeah. It's just, and he, he's funny because you could tell he's like so tired of working there sort of like he had this attitude like yeah like they're doing like these abbey road like the horns abbey it's like a the vst plug-in stuff for studios he's like yeah they've been like recording the the horns thing and i'm just so sick of hearing horns like where they basically go in and sample horns in the room or strings or like abbey road drums as a plug-in you can buy Gotcha. He was, and he was like, yeah, I just have to sit there for like two hours while a guy hits a tom. And they're like sampling. And he, you could just tell he's like, he's like, yeah, this is cool, but I mean, I'm over it. It was, it was bizarre. Yeah. But I get it, though. I mean, when you, you know, when you work somewhere like that, it probably loses its magic. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Eventually, it would just become, it would just become a job, unfortunately. Especially right. if somebody's just whacking on a tom for two hours. It, yeah. You would start to go go insane yeah i can't i've I've thought about that before you know using drum plugins and stuff like oh man i can't imagine the recording process for this must be the most grueling and annoying thing of all yeah. time yeah it has to be it has to be and it makes me wonder do, i because i don't really know and this is just speaking kind of off subject but do they get a drummer to even do it or do they just have engineers in there the whole time um, I didn't get to see it, but I did ask some questions because I actually had like at that time I was using all the Abbey Road stuff. I mean, really good stuff. He he said like, yeah, they'll have a horn section or a drum kit or whatever they're doing, and there's a producer. They treat it like a record, and so this producer, like I imagine on a drum, the way he described it, they'd be like, we're gonna do this snare. Okay, they have they have like a a '60s Ludwig kit or what a '50s kit. So that that producer is going to be out in that room and they're going to say, strike it this way, you know, strike it this way, more attack, less attack, softer, louder. And that's, it's being produced. I mean, they're very, very meticulous on what they're trying to capture. So it wasn't like somebody just goes in a room and like bangs on them and they move on. I think that was, it's probably weeks of work. I mean, from what it sounded like, especially the horns. I mean, you can imagine the, Oh, emphasis man. on like one note, like a trumpet. You can do a one note so many ways. Um, so yeah, I can't imagine. I'd probably go crazy too. Yeah, I, I would. I would definitely go insane. Yeah. Let's see. All right, we're gonna go. We're gonna go a different way now that we've talked about all that epic stuff. <coughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, do you remember what your first uh, guitar was? Oh yeah, vividly in mm -hmm. detail. So you know the whole Pearl Jam experience got me going, and um, I remember started listening to some of that, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's that idea like I should get a guitar. You know, I could be a guitar hero. <laughs> yep. So um, I bugged my mom about it. My dad was like, I don't even remember his involvement in it, but you know, he was kind of like, whatever. But my mom, I just bugged her. I was always around my mom a little more. So I just drive her crazy, you know, come home from school. My friend's got a guitar. There's this guy that plays guitar whatever. So she like one day, I don't know how this transpired. I'm from a very small town called Russellville, Alabama. So, I mean, we're talking 
pretty small. There's not a lot of options there. It's like one guitar shop that carried like a banjo and some strings or something. So it wasn't like there weren't a lot of options. And I guess somewhere she heard like Sam's Club in Muscle Shoals, which is like 30 minutes away. Like um, if you're familiar with Muscle Shoals, it's a pretty famous city. That's what I grew up near. Oh, um, all, yeah. All, yeah. There's like a documentary on it now. So I, I kind of, that was my stomping ground. So we load up in the car and she takes me to Sam's Club and we bought a, they had these packs, like the starter packs. It was before you saw like the Fender starter pack and all, but it was a Sonic brand, um, red Stratocaster ripoff with like a 1.8 battery powered amp. And I remember <laughs> getting that and just... It had a button on it that was distortion. Yes. And that that button was always engaged. And I I vividly remember like Smells Like Teen Spirit being worked out and all those, you know, just like that era was just so, you know, the memories are so great. Um, yeah, that's so first, it was, it, yeah. That's the first song I learned on guitar. Yeah, I think my, <laughs> the first song I learned... Well, song is an overstatement, but riff. Um, right. Okay, yeah, I should say yeah. that. Yeah. It's like the tab gener how old are you? Are you like I I'm twenty seven. Okay. Uh, yeah, so yep. it's similar, really close. We're like five, six years apart. Yeah. The mm -hmm. I was I would say I'm the that tab gener you probably are too. The tabs are such a big deal. Most but I remember definitely. uh Everclear Santa Monica. The yes. Na -na, yes. Na -na 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 -na. You know, it's just like I when I learned that I was like I'm gonna be famous. <laughs> right. And uh, uh, yes, I didn't really know yet. You know, move to the four or five of the the chord, but I was just like that one riff on the one there was just like money, and that uh, that was my first that's first riff. And then I think Come As You Are got worked out, and mm -hmm. Teen Spirit was you know that was that was a little difficult. It had the palm muting and the the scratching, so I think that came later. Yeah. But that that was my first one, and I remember it vividly because I was playing it on an old uh, like '70s Takamine acoustic, so it didn't yes. quite it didn't quite sound right. That was actually a pretty good guitar to learn on, but yeah. uh, uh, it did not quite sound like I, it would come on the radio, and I'd yeah, this is gonna this will probably be familiar to you. It would come on the radio, and I'd quickly run over and stick my blank cassette tape in and hit record, oh, yeah. so, I, so I could listen to it later. And <laughs> oh yeah, I'm so glad you did that. I, I tell people about making the cassettes, and they're just like blank stares. You know, they're like, "What?" Yeah, I did that oh. as well. I made mixtapes off the radio. Had like, oh. yes, yeah, oh my Oasis and uh, Collective Soul, Bush, um, yeah, all that. That's really funny. Yeah, I did the exact same thing. It was like anything that was popular, you know, yeah. at, at that time. I was like, oh, I gotta. Well, mom and dad aren't going to buy me this, so I got to get it off the radio. You know, it was like old school exactly. pirate, old school pirating, but it took yeah. a lot more effort than uh, than it would nowadays. It did. <laughs> That's good stuff. <clears throat> so, um, what was your first like, like when you would would you would say you got your first like real guitar setup, like when you would like play in oh. bands or whatever? Yeah, man, this is a good one. I. You know that came out of your mouth, and I was like, "Why have I not actually thought about this more?" I have a, I have some memories. Okay, I'll walk through it quickly. I remember the first, the second amp I got was this, like Randall One Ten solid state amp. It was like green, and then I, I kept trading them. Like, and then that amp was louder. I remember it was much louder, and it had tremolo, and that was amazing. And then I remember. At some point, getting into the band scenario, that is where I purchased somewhere. I got this Dean Markley, like 100 watt 212 solid state amp, and that, like stereo chorus. Okay. And I remember, yeah, I mean, it's just such a bizarre amp. And I actually saw one in a pawn shop, like in some city, because I'll, I'll jump in pawn shops all the time and see what they have. And I played through it, and I was like, this is pretty good, actually. I mean, it was like, it didn't suck. Um, but I remember trading that. Uh, so what, so when I was really playing music, I mean, in a band making money by that time I had gotten a Fender rock pro 100, like, like a 412 cab and a head, which was a big deal. And then I also custom, if you remember the custom tuck and roll stuff. Uh, oh yeah, definitely. So the first two band that I got was 
they came back out and they did these tube heads and the cab and I got a hold of one really cheap. And that was like a two channel all tube rig. And I had never had a tube amp. And I remember, I remember getting it. I remember playing it and like hearing that was like the first tone experience. I think everything up to that point was like, I mean, honestly, I couldn't tell the difference in a DS one and like a $400 hand built. There was no way like, it, everything was more about just songs and if the band sounded good, you know? Right. And then at that point, I remember the tube amp and I remember being like, this is different. And then that started the whole tube thing. And I ended up getting, uh, around that time, I remember like, uh, cold play. This is like where we're getting at now. It was like late nineties and like cold play was kind of had come out and the Fender Hot Rod DeVilles were huge. And I remember getting like oh, a, yes. four, a 410 DeVille. And uh, that was where all the tone stuff happened. I bought a full drive. And yeah, so that the late 90s was that evolution of, of gear for me. But yeah, I went through several amps, you know, to on that journey. So were there other guitars involved also in the amp journey? <sighs> yeah, so like that whole tonal journey for me, like, you know late 90s you know i guitar wise um my main guitar was a uh i got a hold of this uh i think this is a standard strat and i remember i had an auto body shop painted pewter silver because i saw this silver guitar i thought it was great i had a friend that like painted cars so he repainted it had lace sensors in it you remember when those were big Oh yeah. Uh, so that that was like a really cool guitar I had and then uh probably my main guitar through all that. That was like the secondary, but I still have my main guitar. It's I have a lot of gear and I get rid of a lot of gear, but I will always keep this uh Telecaster. I was in a I was in a uh a club and bought this guy's Tele. It was a Nash like a Nashville series, so I had the, the three pickups, the Tele and the two strap pickups. Right. And um Sunburst and uh yeah, it's still with me. I have so many different pit guards and I've put so many configurations and I've put switches and I was a big Johnny Greenwood Radiohead fan, so this guitar literally looks like his Rosewood one and I wired it the same, had the kill switches and all that and but at this point it's a uh it has a Gretsch pickup in the neck. And then a stock bridge pickup. And that guitar, when I got it, I got it for like $200. But the guy had put three Joe Barden pickups in it. And those, I sold them on eBay for a grand when I learned what they were. That was years later. I didn't know what they were. They were like the Rel pickups. Um, But I still have that guitar and uh, Captain America sticker on the back of it. The whole thing that that has played many, (laughs) many, many, many shows and many sessions and all. It's like one of those weird guitars where, uh, you know, it's like a Mexican Fender, but there's nothing that feels that good. Every once in a while, you just stumble on one. It's like a 97 model. Um, just a great guitar. That was that was my first guitar where I, like, realized there's something different about the guitar. It's not about how it really looks. It's about how does it sound, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, how it how it feels. Yeah, exactly. It, it kind of went beyond the this guitar looks cool. Like I kind of quit caring how they looked at that point as well because you know it was a telly and I never even thought I'd like tellies and I've always been a big telly guy since that. Nice. That Gretsch pickup uh, is that just like a regular filter tron or or what is yeah, it? Yeah, it's it's some. I think it's like an off brand filter tron thing of some sort. Uh, yeah, but it's it's it. I'm not actually sure what model. It's not an off brand, but it's like a weird. It's not like your generic filter Tron, but it is a. It's a Gretschy, cool, fat neck pickup. Very cool. Really nice. Very very nice. Now, well, since we're going on the tonal journey, still, did you have particular pedals other than the Keeley stuff that you were using? Yeah, at the time? yeah. I'm, man, if I think back, well, this era, I'm I'm actually before the Keeley at this point, so I didn't get the Keeley stuff till like '03 era 0304 so in this era of like right around the time i graduated high school that was playing tons of shows traveling like i i that was like my first like i'm gonna try to actually do this as a career 
Um, I man, my rig at that time was probably a little embarrassing on the pedal side. But the good parts I remember were, and I still love this pedal, the original Dan Echo, the the Dan Echo delay. Oh, yeah. That is still mm-hmm. one of my favorite delays. I use that a lot. And um, drives, I man, I, I have a hard time remembering. I feel like I bought the Daddio and the Dan Echo together. So I probably had the Daddio on there, which is like a Marshall Governor thing. And I know I had a... Uh, I might have had an SD1, you know, it was like just kind of standard stuff, but it, you know, even being on this side of it, they're good sounding effects and they were just, that boutique thing hadn't really, it wasn't really a thing yet. Yeah. Yeah. It might, you know, it probably depended on what you were doing and what city, but I think full tone and love pedal, some of those guys started around that time, but you know, I didn't hear of boutique until Oh, one or two and the first thing i saw was i remember seeing like the full drive and the the distortion pro the full tone distortion pro and then mm-hmm. i remember seeing like the first visual sound stuff like the route 66 and the silver box and all that that was the first boutique stuff so it was that was like two three years later so we're kind of pre i guess it was pre-boutique i mean it was kind of like yeah you know people had a tube screamer or a ds1 or whatever yeah I was trying to pinpoint the other day, like, at what, was there a year that everything kind of, like, when it became a thing? It almost seems like it kind of happened all at once as far as the boutique pedals. Like, it does. It, is it just me, or does it feel that way to you, too? Like, it feels like all of a sudden, there yeah, was it, all these companies. Yeah, it, it does. Um, you know, I, when I got into this, I fixed my pedal... And it was very much an accident. I never thought I'd do this for a living at all in any way remotely. It just kind of took over. But I remember when I started, I looked up to, you know, this is all there was. This is 08. Well, 07 and like late 07. So this paints a picture of what existed that I saw. But now I know like Earthquaker actually existed and Catlin Bread and there was Diamond. But they were, they must have just been very small you know compared and social media wasn't a thing either that's another big deal because for sure social media can make you seem bigger than you are and i think there's or you know like more out there than you are because but now it's such a big piece of how we hunt for gear and stuff but i remember like 0708 like full tone i remember calling mike fuller and being like hey man i've got this uh this is like 2003 or 4 i remember calling he answers in the shop which is crazy. And he's and I said, man, is there any way you can like mod the full drive so the boost is separate? And he's like, nope. And uh, and now we do that mod, obviously. And he's actually put out a model that way now. So I remember that's kind of the environment. Like it was, it still felt small. You know, it was like him and uh, Bob Wild at Visual Sound, Robert. There was Analog Man as well, which was really respected. Like some of the mods. The mods were Definitely. a big deal. I think that era... You know, the mods were really accessible because, you know, you got a blues driver and or a tube screamer and you probably saved up to get that. And then it's like you look at the price of some love pedal or something that doesn't make sense, but you might could muster up 45 bucks and get a mod. But right. now, but I mean, since that 08 period, I've said this a few times in interviews, like it is crazy. I mean, you can throw a rock at your window and hit like two pedal companies. And so... Yeah. <laughs> that's how it feels that's that's not a, a very exagger yeah that's not an exaggeration <laughs> yeah it is crazy and so um and i'll see 10 or 15 a year come and then i see it feels like 20 go um and so it's real interesting how how the market is it's kind of strange and there's guys that stick out and there's guys that make it and there's guys that fall by the wayside so we've been really fortunate and just just really fortunate and thankful to our fans and people that love our company just you know for being here at this point because there have been a lot of people and I think for me the pedal boom when I started seeing it go crazy was probably about two years after I started which was you know probably probably 2010 11 is when I feel like it just went bananas like somebody opened the gate you know that's that's about what I was thinking too like I knew of stuff in 2007 ish all basically the same players you're talking about plus a few other guys and then it's like 
Yeah, 2010. Here it comes. Yeah, Boom. and a lot, a lot of that's probably the DIY community got really strong and really helpful in that area. I think there's so many websites you can, you you started to see like, oh, I can go jump on this website and learn how to read a schematic, and wow, this guy has a whole web page, you know, like just telling me how stuff works. Like that stuff never existed, and so I think along with that um, came a big push and like people realizing they could do it. Um, so, and I've said this many times, it's, it's not hard to build an overdrive. And I started with DIY stuff, you know, um, what's hard is educating past DIY and running a business. <laughs> that's like, yeah, <laughs> that's really where, yeah, there's been great pedals that I've played and great people making pedals. And for some reason they, they don't hit success. And, I think there's a lot of reasons for that stuff, you know, right place, the right time, good marketing, running a business like, you know, JHS is almost self imploded four or five times just from growing like growth is really dangerous. And a lot of pedal companies, amp companies, guitar companies, it can be easy to build a guitar or a pedal or an amp. I'm not saying anyone can do it, but people can do it. And I think as long as you're a company that realizes you're not doing some sacred art that's untouchable. You know, there are great pedal guys and there are kids right now. And there may be, there may be a 14, 15 year old kid listening to this. And that kid might just be brilliant and just surpass me in five years. And you have to have that attitude as a company, you know, stay creative, run your business efficient, have good marketing and, and be personable. I think that's huge. And I think, um, I think this era, you know, we said it earlier in the show, it's just such a rich era for gear. And um, I think we'll all look back in 10 years or so, and I really want to be a part of what's to come. And I think that really just comes down to just those those fundamental things, like just great service and um, having great products that are creative and beyond the DIY thing. I think it's really important. And we're seeing a lot of that now, and it's amazing. That's why it's such a good period, because the competition is so great. You know, like if you're in the town and you're the only barber shop, it's one thing. But let's say three more open, you got to do your haircuts a lot better. And that's kind of what we're. <laughs> yeah, that, that's like what we're seeing with gear. And I think that flood of DIY and that flood of the market is making greater products. That you can't just make a tube screamer anymore. Um, you got to do something exceptional. I totally agree. That's I think that's why we're seeing what we're seeing is people ha are realizing companies are realizing yeah like you say a tube screamer uh, or a clone clone is not going to cut it anymore like exactly that's not, not yeah. going to float your boat for very long yeah so. and those those are great things i mean who doesn't love both of those but it's just like you have to find something that's great you know what is great and it's kind of like people defining that that's really cool to see cool to be a part of one of the things I think that's interesting about what you guys do over there, um, besides having cool products, is continuing doing uh, the recasing and the mods to other stuff. There's not a whole lot of people that are that get to your, you know, you know where you're at and continue to do that kind of work. It makes it very, I think, very interesting for people to see those one-off projects. Yeah, we, you know, I started what I did by, you know, I had a broken Keeley pedal fixed it. And then I got a stock version of that. And I sat down with a notebook and I didn't know what I was doing. And I wrote down these numbers and what he had changed. And I wanted to learn what he was doing. And that, so we started, you know, I started with modifying boss pedals and um, moved on to these other brands. And then, and then, you know, some of my favorite circuits, like a, like a black box blues breaker, I started tweaking that and thought, man, people would love this in its own form. And that came the morning glory. And then, you know, like my rap became the all American. And so that's how it all started. And I really value the modification side and that custom feel, because when I started like mod my pedal or man, build me this custom uh, blues breaker thing. And like your morning glory idea. And like, I want to look like this. And I really, I really love the, a lot of it is those memories of how the company started and just being able to do that, you know, like offer somebody at this point, you've seen, if you follow our Instagram, I, I think it's just so cool how it's evolved. Like the digital printing, we can make your pedal look so awesome. And I love that. I love that custom feel. And 
as long as we can do that, um, I want to offer, you know, the hand built line that you get in stores, but I also want you to be able to call us up or email us and have your grandmother's face painted on your pedal or whatever you want. <laughs> I, I just think it's cool. And as, as long as we can, we'll do it. We've almost stopped it several times, but it's, it's good. It still makes a little bit of money. We're not getting rich off of it, but it's worth doing. And I think, I think people really love it, you know? Yeah. And I think it's worth doing from the, uh, what you were saying about being personable. That is a, that's a, as about as personable of a touch as you can get. Yeah, as far exactly. as the company is is concerned, I think that's just a an awesome thing to keep doing. Um, uh, from a, a kind of from a just a I don't know, like a branding perspective, almost yeah. it just sets you apart that much more, and it's and it is cool. It you know it is really cool. So I appreciate that. That means a lot. Yeah, we that's that's why I keep doing it. I I hope people love it. Seems like they do. Yeah, I got a, I got an eyeball on a few things in my cabinet that could probably do a recase uh, right. right now. I, I have the the pedal cabinet of <laughs> yeah. Well, dude, of, you get them together and email me, and I'll I'll hook you up with some friend pricing. So ooh, yeah. Uh, all right, man. Feed the habit. Well, <laughs> it's it's dangerous, man. All right. Well, I um. You know, I know you've listened to the show before, so you kind of know what I'm about to say. I think um, we've we've eclipsed that that hour mark by a little ways, and yeah. uh, everyone's already asleep or they're at home playing with their JHS pedals, and uh, we're but a distant memory. Yeah, well, anyone that listened to this, I'm super grateful. I'm glad that I'm remotely that interesting because sometimes I don't feel that interesting. So. Uh, be encouraged. Do what you do. Well, it was a really good chat. I really enjoyed talking to you, and I'm hoping that we can uh, do it again sometime. Yeah, yeah. We're you know uh, evolving yearly, so we can do it again for sure. It'll be a different, little different next time. Sounds good, man. Well, uh, as per usual, everybody. For Josh, I'm Blake. And good luck and good tones. See you later, man. See ya. Man, that was a enjoyable talk. Another big thanks to Josh for coming on and shooting the old breeze. And also a big thanks to you guys who are listening. I really, really appreciate it. If it wasn't for you guys listening, I wouldn't be doing this. So thank you very much. And if you're wondering about maybe how you can help keep this uh, this big machine rolling, there's a couple options that I have for you that I haven't really talked about on the show before. So one of the things is pretty obvious. You can uh, head on over to ToneMob.com slash store and check out anything that piques your interest there. There's not a lot yet, but there will be a lot eventually. So check that out, see if there's anything of interest to you. The other option would be to head to tonemob.com slash associates, and there you'll find a couple different links. You'll find one for Rogue Guitar Shop. So if you're planning on purchasing any pedals, and let's be honest, if you're listening to this podcast, you are planning on purchasing some pedals or other various sorts of gear. So if you uh, purchase anything through that link, that comes back and uh, helps us out. Plus, they're good dudes, good customer service, and uh, yeah. But Blake... I'm not planning on buying anything in the near future gear-related-wise. Oh, well, I understand. Sometimes the gear fund gets a bit tapped. However, I know you're planning on buying something. You know how I know? The holidays are coming up, that's how. The other option I got for you is you can hit the link to Amazon, which literally has everything that you could ever want to buy in the entire world. So, if you're, you know, shopping for, I don't know, maybe your little sister needs... Uh, My Little Pony. Maybe you need some My Little Pony. You know, we're not going to judge. I also won't tell anybody, so, you know, you can rest easy knowing your secret is safe with me. So I'll be putting all of that info in the show notes, so you should be able to see that wherever it is that you choose to listen. Um, If you're already on the website, you can pretty much see where to go. Um, So, yeah, I really, really appreciate it. And once again, thank you very much for listening and I hope you tune in next week. i got some rad guests lined up for you. So take her easy and, you know, have a good day. <laughs>